regarding the stomach, uh, regarding the volvulus. So, you see, this is a normal stomach. In stomach, this is the GE junction. This is the enteropyloric region. This is the axis of the stomach. Okay. This is the longitudinal axis of the stomach. Okay. And this is known as the vertical axis of the stomach. This is normal. Okay. Vertical. Sorry. This is the vertical or the vertical axis. And this is the longitudinal axis. So, generally what I prefer is to remember only the longitudinal axis which extends from the GE junction to the enteropyloric region this way. Okay. And now, most commonly the gastric volvulus occurs along this longitudinal axis this way. Okay. And this type of volvulus is the most common and is known as the organoaxial volvulus. So, organoaxial volvulus is the volvulus of the stomach along the longitudinal axis of the stomach. Okay. And the volvulus along the vertical axis of the stomach is known as mesenteroaxial. Okay. Most common type of volvulus is organoaxial. Okay. Now, we will discuss types of volvulus. First is organoaxial, the second is mesenteroaxial. This organoaxial is seen in two third cases, it is more common. Mesenteroaxial is seen in one third cases, it is less common. This is torsion along the longitudinal axis. This is torsion along the longitudinal axis of stomach and it is it presents with acute abdominal pain. Okay. Presents with acute abdominal pain as emergency. Okay. Whereas this occurs along the vertical axis, torsion along vertical axis. And this is partial and recurrent. Okay. So, if I will explain it with a diagram here. This is the normal axis or the longitudinal axis. This occurs like this. Whereas, in the mesenteroaxial, this is the normal axis and this occurs like this. Okay. It folds on its own. Now, there are two types of gastric volvulus, organoaxial and mesenteroaxial. The volvulus can also be described as a primary gastric volvulus or a secondary gastric volvulus. The primary gastric volvulus is generally not seen along with any other structural defect. Okay. But the secondary volvulus occurs due to presence of a diaphragmatic defect, okay, or is seen in diaphragmatic hernias. So, to remember, this is of two types primary gastric volvulus or a secondary gastric volvulus. We generally see a secondary gastric volvulus. So, I will first tell you what is the secondary gastric volvulus. It is secondary to a diaphragmatic defect. I have shown it a diagram to you in the esophagus topic in which there was an upside down type of a stomach and it was associated with a diaphragmatic defect. Okay. So, secondary to a diaphragmatic defect associated with diaphragmatic hernias. Generally, the type 2 or the type 3 type of diaphragmatic hernias. Okay. Most common type is organoaxial, which is seen. And most common cause in children is obviously the congenital diaphragmatic hernia or the Bogdalek type. In adults, it is paraesophageal hernia, the type 2 or type 3, which is more common among the two. Type 3 is more common than type 2. So, in paraesophageal hernias, in paraesophageal hernias, the more common association is with the type 3 hernia and in congenital diaphragmatic hernia, more commonly it is associated with the Bogdalek type of hernia. Now, 
what is the primary gastric volvulus the primary gastric volvulus is mainly mesenteroaxial it is partial recurrent as i have already told you and there is no diaphragmatic defect okay but it is associated with a few other congenital anomalies which are congenital asplenia or wandering spleen or wandering spleen okay so just to remember you, what you can do is like if there is some splenic pathology but not a diaphragmatic defect so this along with the splenic pathology there is some excessive mobilization of stomach leading to a primary gastric volvulus now there is a patient which is reaching to your emergency with complaints of pain abdomen and you are trying to place a, with multiple type of retching and but the patient is not able to vomit and when you are trying to place a rice tube you are unable to place a rice tube also because the stomach is folded on its own okay so this classical triad is known as borchard triad or borchard triad or card triad in this triad there is presence of epigastric pain epigastric pain and there is inability to vomit and there is inability to pass a rail tube okay this is borchardt triad how we will diagnose we can diagnose it by barium swallow or barium meal barium series and upper gi endoscopy after the diagnosis how we will treat okay so the treatment depends on the type of the treatment depends on the type of hernia okay or the type of volvulus sorry whether there is presence of hernia or not on the basis of that we will decide what kind of treatment is to be performed so treatment is different for organoaxial and mesenteroaxial for organoaxial there is acute volvulus whenever there is acute volvulus there is presence of diaphragmatic hernia now there is a stomach which is rotated like this first we will derotate the stomach then we will reduce the content and after that we will close the defect okay we will reduce the stomach uncoil the stomach and we will repair the diaphragmatic defect we will repair the defect in the diaphragm whereas if there is a spontaneous volvulus or a mesenteroaxial type there is no defect and there is no herniation into the chest so in that case we will have to just derotate the stomach and then we will have to fix the stomach so that it will not go again okay so in this case we will have to just derotate the stomach followed by fixation of stomach so this derotation followed by fixation of stomach which is also known as gastropexy okay this is also known as gastropexy okay so now i will just tell you two more questions and then we will finish okay so uh, the next topic is teapot stomach and hourglass stomach okay so just see these two topics teapot stomach and our glass stomach just to understand okay okay so first we will discuss tea pot stomach this is a normal stomach suppose there is ulcer here okay now 
whenever this ulcer is healing due to contracture or scarring this portion will go up so there will be due to this scarring there will be appearance like teapot okay and this teapot stomach will be due to longitudinal scarring or shortening of lesser curvature of stomach occurs in gastric ulcers so it is seen in gastric ulcers okay longitudinal shortening along the lesser curvature of stomach is leads to teapot stomach okay now our glass stomach okay now we know that this is normal stomach and we want it to be like this okay so that it will fit into the our glass stomach how this our glass stomach will form whenever there is a saddle shaped ulcer here or circumferential type of ulcer which contracts like this from in between okay and due to which there is a development of our glass stomach so whenever there is a longitudinal ulcer it will contract like this so it will form a teapot shaped stomach whenever there is this kind of ulcer whenever it will contract in this direction it will form a our glass stomach okay so if there is a ulcer like this there is ulcer like this and then it will form this secatricial contraction of saddle shaped ulcer at lesser curvature leads to formation of hourglass stomach so that's all about stomach